we sing that, we believe that you are forever faithful, always good and so kind. You give us grace upon grace upon grace, and we just love you for who you are, God. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts through your word today, God. Help us to know you more as you speak to us, Lord. And it's all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Welcome, everyone, this morning. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name's Colin. If you're joining us online, I have asked that the video be turned off. Um, we'll kind of uh, see that in a second of why. Of course, iPad needs to open up. Classic technology. All right, so my name is Colin, um, and my wife and I have been serving, doing missions for about eight years now. Um, part of that in the U.S., part of that overseas um, in countries uh, where it is uh, really hard to hear the gospel um, and where the gospel is not readily proclaimed. Um, so this past a few years, we've been in Eastern Asia. Um, and yes, I say Eastern Asia, we kind of keep that um, as the name there. But I grew up here in Alito and actually in this church, and so it's super fun that I've actually been able to come back and speak here. Uh, this is a huge blessing. I've also just wanted to say, man, thank you guys for helping us being sent out into the world. Man, through this church and through a lot of you guys, you've sent us uh, to proclaim the gospel uh, where Jesus is not known very well. So let's pray, and then let's uh, get to work here. Father, we thank you so much for who you are, um, that you are God and that we are not. So God, we just humbly come before you um, today, um, open up your word. I'm God's spirit that you would just be here um, in this room, uh, teach through me. Um, teach through your word, and teach us to continue to live a life that is surrendered and submitted to you. All right, amen. Let's go. All right, so if you uh, get to know me a little bit, uh, you know, man, I am a storyteller. Uh, it is uh, one of the reasons why I'm very late to a lot of things, uh, because I'm too busy before, man, talking to people, um, chatting it up, uh, just hanging out with people. Uh, but my wife keeps me on track a little bit. She's kind of a type A person, has a schedule for me. Um, if it doesn't go on my schedule... I'm probably not going to show up to it. It's great. Um, so I have a couple here, a couple points here uh, for you type A people of, hey, where are we going? Uh, so you can take notes, you can jot those down, uh, but if you're like me, man, you can just give me your eyeballs, soak it up, and we can just hang out. And so the first point, man, we're going to talk about who is the Holy Spirit. Noah has said who is the Holy Spirit, not what is the Holy Spirit. Uh, secondly, why is he essential for being a follower of Christ? And then where do we kind of go from here? So kind of some practical points um, in that. And so those are kind of where we're going. Uh, but overall, I really want to teach about, man, what has God been showing uh, my wife and I as we've been doing missions? And a lot of what he's been showing us is how to walk in the power and presence of his spirit. Man, how do we have fellowship with God? And how do we live a life, man, submitted to him? So as we went overseas, we went over uh, to Eastern Asia in about uh, August 2019. And uh, for our first week, uh, we got to just walk around on campuses. We do university missions. Uh, we got to just ask people two questions, kind of giving a survey of the spiritual landscape there. And so we asked people two questions. Man, are you a Christian, or do you know of a Christian? And so for one full week, seven days, we walked around these campuses asking these two questions, and we found one person that knew a Christian. We found zero people that were a Christian. We, knew one, we found one person who knew of a Christian. And that blew my mind, right? I'm coming from Texas, where I could walk out anywhere on the street and ask someone, hey, are you a Christian? And they might say, yeah. But at least, at very least, they might know of a Christian. Or be like, yeah, there's like 10 churches on every street corner. Do that. And so we kind of went into ministry with this mindset of like, hey, like, we may be the only Christians on this campus. We may be the only people here um, preaching Jesus to these people. And so we kind of laid out our mission field before us. And so my first day of ministry, um, first we go out and I'm going to go meet a bunch of people. Uh, and so a lot of the students there, they play basketball. I'm not a basketball person, right? I'm not really in shape. When I shoot the ball, it goes that way, never where I want it to go. But I was like, that's fine. I can go hang out, play basketball, um, and get to kind of be a part of these students. So we go out, we hang out, and me and my friend is the other guy on my team. Uh, we meet 30 guys our first day. I'm like, holy cow, how am I going to follow up 30 people my first day? Not a clue. And so I'm dripping sweat. It's like Houston weather, right? 10,000% humidity, like 100 degrees Fahrenheit, ridiculous swampy weather. 
And so uh, I'm just dripping with sweat. I'm exhausted. Again, I'm just not about this. Um, and so we're starting walking back through our campus after meeting these 30 guys, getting their information. Uh, but my friend, he's a, he's a track athlete for A&M, so he's used to this running, and he spots a track on a university. He's like, hey, I'm going to go talk to these guys real quick, and then we can head back home. He's like, sounds great, man. Awesome. So I'm hanging out at these basketball courts, just, again, just, man, trying to look like I'm not breathing too hard, trying to put on the show. Um, after a few minutes, I realize, man, I'm awkwardly kind of standing next to a guy, like, actually pretty close. I'm like, how did I not notice him? I mean, and something inside of me is like, hey, Colin, you should actually talk to that guy. I'm like, no, 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 that's fine. I'm not going to do that. Listen, I have 30 names. Here's where my excuses start coming in, right? I don't know how I'm going to follow up these 30 people already. And, man, this, the spirit inside me is like, I don't know, you should talk to this one more guy. I'm like, no, 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 no I'm not going to do that. And so casually, you know, I'm like, I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to go try and rent a basketball. Realize I have to pay to rent a basketball. I'm very cheap. Just kidding, not going to rent a basketball. Walk back over here. Realize I just made a full circle around this guy like I'm surveying him. Kind of awkward. And so, and again, the spirit inside me is like, hey, you should, you should go talk to this guy. Fine, begrudgingly. Hey, man, what's up? His English is very terrible. My language skills also very terrible. So there's a thick language barrier right here. And so already I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be ridiculous. And so uh, him and I talk for just a second, casually exchanging conversation, you know, exchange each other's numbers. I'm like, fine, I did it. You, you, are you happy, spirit in me? Like, I did it. So he starts walking away. I'm um, feeling good about myself. Now I have 31 people to follow up. Uh, he gets about 20 yards away. He stops. He turns around, and he runs back up to me. And I'm like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. He gets within like a few inches of my face, my personal space. Um, and he's like, what do you believe? And I freak out. I'm like, holy cow, I'm going to get kicked out of this country a week of being here. Ridiculous. And I was like, oh, and he's like, what do you believe? And I was like, oh, well, like, I'm a Christian. And he gets even closer, and he's like, me too. I mean, I just kind of freeze and like, holy cow, I've been walking around for a week trying to find someone who even knows a Christian. I just standing next to one. And so he pulls out his phone, slipping through it, uh, and he points to a Bible app. He goes, do you know? And I go, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, he flips through the Bible, flips through the Bible, goes to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It's called the Great Commission. It says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he kind of points to him and he goes, do you know? And this is like my company's motto, is Matthew 28. I'm like, yeah, I'm aware. And he goes, just in perfect English, he's like, man, this is our duty as Christians. Man, this guy is uh, the guy who we would start funneling a lot of new believers to um, because he um, was a believer and part of an underground church there. And so, man, as I was just like, look back at that story, I'm like, holy cow, Colin, like the Spirit was obviously telling you to go talk to this guy. But in the moment, I just kind of ignore that. And so I think a lot of times when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we get a little confused sometimes. Like, hey, I understand God the Father. I understand God the Son. uh, But the Spirit is kind of like this mm, awkward child, right? Like, what do we do with him? Like, you know, is he about to start speaking in tongues up here? Or like, do I need to start leaving? I'm a little confused, a little hesitant. And so I really want to start teaching, man, who is the Holy Spirit? Man, what is he about? And why is he so essential for the believer in their everyday ministry? in their everyday walk of life, at work, at home, at school. And so let's go. We're about to throw up a couple verses up here. Um, You can follow along in your Bible. We're going to go pretty fast at first, so uh, hopefully they'll be up here. So the first one is Genesis 1-2. So it says, Now the earth was formless and void, or empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So one point I want to make here is, uh, man, the Spirit is at the beginning. He is God. He is eternally present in creation, before creation, and is eternally present after, in the future, too. And so why this is important is the Holy Spirit is not just a New Testament thing we kind of came up with um, to kind of help, uh, help believers out. Man, He is eternally God, right? Uh, second one up here, John 16, 7, says, But very truly, I tell you, it is, and this is Jesus talking, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Right? So this is kind of crazy. Of, man, the Spirit is talking right here, or sorry, Jesus is talking right here, and he's like, uh, man, it is for your advantage that I go away. And I'm like, are you serious? Like, you know all the things that Jesus did? Raised people from the dead, cured blindness, did some incredible things. Like, it is for your advantage that I go away. I love another translation. It actually calls it uh, a helper instead of an advocate, right? And so God knows we need a helper in every aspect of our lives. 
And so one way we kind of like see this is I think a lot of times we can kind of gloss over the effects of sin and death in our life. And so one way I like to kind of uh, phrase this is, man, is, do you know of any area of your life that doesn't have drama or stress involved in it? Right, man, you go to work, at home, with family, with friends, at church. There's drama and stress everywhere. And so, man, the Lord knows that we need a helper in every aspect of our lives. Let's go to the next one. So John 14, 12 here. Again, Jesus talking. It says, Verily, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Right? So Jesus ascends. He's now sitting at the right hand of God, and he sends this Holy Spirit. And he's like, you guys are going to do greater works than me. Like, can you imagine, like, being his disciples at that point, or even us hearing that now? I'm like, I'm going to do greater things than Jesus? Like, mm, I don't know. But the same spirit that empowered Jesus in his ministry is the same spirit that empowers us today, or at least should. Last rapid verse here, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. This is Paul talking. He's at the end of his letters to the church of Corinth. He says, man, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Man, we are to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And fellowship is kind of a lost concept in our culture, right? We live very fast lives here in America, right? We're throwing chicken nuggets in the back, telling our kids just to eat that. We'll go into every single soccer practice, football practice, baseball practice. They have to be all over the state, not including, men. what we are already doing in our work, in our activities. Man, we live busy lives. If we ever do get a moment of rest, man, we just kind of numb ourselves with, like, Netflix and Hulu. And I love Stranger Things. Man, I have binged almost every single Star Wars movie on Disney+. Plus. Um, there we go. Absolutely. Man, I love it. And so this fellowship, man, what is fellowship? Um, there's a reason God kind of, in the Bible, you'll notice a lot, he centers his people around meals. Take Exodus, for example, right? Uh, God causes a bunch of plagues to happen. He rescues his people out of uh, slavery in Egypt. He parts the sea so they can walk through it on dry land. And he's leading them around the desert via a pillar of fire and smoke. I'm like, I want to see that. That sounds awesome. And so he tells his people, um, we're going to have this meal. It's going to be called the Passover meal. And you're going to remember during this meal all that I have done. Right? So in this meal, you're supposed to remember all that God has done for them, worship who God is, and have fellowship with him over this meal. And so when we go to the New Testament, we actually see Jesus doing the same thing at a Passover meal for the Last Supper. Right? He takes the bread, he takes the wine, and he says, man, eat and drink in remembrance of me. So we're supposed to remember all that Jesus did in the Bible, but also all that Jesus has done in our lives, and worship him as God, right? Have fellowship with our creator. And so it should come to no shock to us whenever we flip to the very last book of the Bible, Revelation, and what's there? A meal. The marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Where all believers are present, we gather with our creator and our Savior, and we have fellowship with God. And that sounds amazing, if you ever do get the uh, option or uh, the ability to go travel and go see other religions, I highly recommend you do so. And go witness just the impossible standards that the other religions have for Man, do these five things, and maybe you'll get eternal life. But the God of the Bible says, man, I know you'll never measure up to this uh, perfection standard. That's why I came down. I died for your failures so that you can, again, have fellowship with God, God and his people together. And it's this close, intimate relationship that God has with his people. And so there's kind of this tension in the Bible a lot, and I, just, I beg you, don't tear this tension away. He is our king, he is our Lord, and yet he desires to have deep fellowship with his people over meals, right? And this is what fellowship is about. And so sometimes we kind of cut the Holy Spirit out of this, of like, again, Father, Son, I get that, Holy Spirit, mm, I don't know. But we're supposed to have fellowship with him. And so the Holy Spirit is God. He is worthy of worship, and we are to have fellowship with him. And so to understand the awe factor of the Holy Spirit, man, we've got to actually go to the Old Testament a little bit. So let's flip there. If you'll flip in your Bibles to Ezekiel 36, that'll kind of be where we are. Um, but it'll be up here, up on the screen too. Use the table of contents, no shame in that, absolutely. 
So kind of the, the story of the Old Testament, right? You have, you have Exodus, and we saw God do some really cool things um, there, some actually incredible things. Uh, but it's weird because as he does some really cool things, you turn the page, and it seems like they've already forgotten it. Right? That's the story throughout the whole Old Testament of, man, God does something crazy. You turn the page, they're worshiping other idols. And you're like, what? What's, what's going on here, people? Like, if I saw that, there's no way I would doubt, right? Mm, of course. And the Old Testament is littered with these stories. So it kind of has a, a name for this condition, right? It calls them that they have a heart of stone. And it is impossible to follow God with this cold, dead heart, actually. And so Ezekiel is one of God's spokesmen or is one of his prophets. And so he's kind of giving a glimpse, or God's giving Ezekiel a glimpse of the solution that he has. And so here in 26 and 27, he says, All right, I'm going to, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So God's solution is this, man, take out this cold, dead heart and give him a soft, moldable heart. But he's not going to stop there. He's actually going to give his spirit, the spirit of the creator God, and he's going to put it inside broken people. He's going to change them from the inside out. And so a lot of times in the Old Testament, God gives demonstrations. And so in chapter 37, he's going to give Ezekiel a demonstration of what this is going to look like. Uh, I highly encourage you to go back and read 36 and 37 all the way through an amazing story. I don't really have time for it here, um, but we have uh, 37 up here. So he brings Ezekiel to this valley, right? And wars are fought in valleys, an army on one side, an army on the other, and they clash and they meet in the middle. And so you can kind of just imagine the carnage of skeletons that Ezekiel's walking around in. So many bones of dead soldiers. And God's like, all right, tell these bones to come alive. So in verse 10, he's like, so I prophesied, and he, and he came to me as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life, stood up on their feet, a vast army. And God's like, man, this is what it's going to be like when the Holy Spirit comes. Man, dead people coming back to life. This is how it's going to be, and it's going to be absolutely crazy. So imagine if we all got up, we all left here, we went down to FM5, right uh, over to the graveyard over there, over to the cemetery. And we kind of sat there, and we're like, man, in the name of the God of the Bible, come alive. And we kind of waited there, and then people started climbing out of their graves, right? People coming back to life. Maybe even friends or family there, man, they came back to life. And what would you do? I would be freaking out. I'm like, are you kidding me? What would your Monday look like tomorrow? And there's no way you just go back to work and be like, oh, man, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, watch the game. Oh, that's great. Well, we saw dead people come back to life. Like, wait, what? Man, all of Alito would know of Jesus within a week. Man, maybe even all of Fort Worth. And God's like, man, this is what it's going to be like when my spirit comes into people. And so maybe you're kind of thinking like the same thing I did when I'm kind of first reading this. Mm, like, well, then what happened to me then, Right? Like, am I not doing something right? Like, am I broken? Like, what's, like, what's kind of going on? Because I don't really see that. So let's jump to the New Testament then. Kind of see what's going on. So Romans 8 here is, we'll, we'll be up for a second. So Romans 8, 6 uh, says, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. And so as we walk in our own power of death before Christ, we're walking in death. We're walking in ruling and reigning in our own lives, which leads to death. And so since all of us before Christ are death, are, are, are living in sin, we deserve death. And this isn't really like a 50-50 thing as we become believers, right? It's not like, oh, well, I was 50% good. Jesus kind of covered the other 50% there, um, and so now I'm good. Right? So, no, no, no. We were death. We were dead in our sin. And so in order to be governed by the flesh means we were actively walking in sin and rebellion against the creator God, ruling and reigning over our own lives. Dead, dead, not mostly dead. But one that is governed by the Spirit is actively walking in the power of the Spirit, submitting their life to God. And so who is ruling and reigning in their life? Not themselves, but God is. The Spirit is. And so this is what he means when he's like, man, life and peace. People who are walking in the power of the Spirit are experiencing life and peace, sustaining life in Christ. And so this is why the Spirit is essential to all believers 
Um, because without him, we do not get to experience the life and peace found in God. And so here's kind of where we have to work a little bit, because as I kind of say that, I meant a hundred different people had a thousand different thoughts of how this looks like in their life, of like things they need to do or something like that. Uh, but that's not quite the case. So 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, Paul talks a little bit about this. And so he says, Men, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready, for you are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Talk about like men a Bible diss, right? Like you're not acting like a mere human. I love that. So he kind of paints three different people here, right? You have the worldly person, you have the worldly Christian, and then you have a spirit-filled person. And so he's painting these three pictures. So I love illustrations, so let's do one. Got my cup here, milk. I'm not actually a milk person, so I don't really like milk. So this cup of milk represents someone's life, right? We'll say this normal milk here represents someone's life before Christ, right? They are ruling and reigning their own life, not experiencing the sustaining life found in Christ through his spirit, right? But then we have our Holy Spirit, chocolate syrup. Who doesn't love chocolate milk? I always kind of think the Holy Spirit's like chocolate, delicious. And so at some point in their life, they become a believer. And boom, Holy Spirit acquired. But what's wrong? It's not chocolate milk yet, right? It actually still looks just like normal milk. If I were to drink this, it would taste like normal milk. But maybe they kind of like go to church now, you know, because they're Christian. Or maybe now they go to a small group now, you know, because it's what good Christians do. But their life is separated. The faith never leaves these walls. Their real life at work and at school and at everywhere else in church life is completely separate, just like the chocolate syrup. And so I would say this is where most Christians live their life in our context. Man, still being governed by the flesh, still ruling and reigning over their own lives. Man, there's little change, little life being experienced by the Spirit. And so this is where Paul is addressing these people. Man, he's like, man, isn't there still jealousy and quarreling among you? Are you not acting like the rest of the world? I mean, it should not surprise us when someone with a heart of stone behaves like the world or goes against something that the Bible says, right? They have a heart of stone. What do we expect? It blows my mind when Christians get up in arms at these people and berate them. And it's like, what are we supposed to expect? What should bug us is when someone who claims to be a follower of Christ and dwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit behaves like the rest of the world. But even then, we don't berate and we don't argue and we don't shout at these people. We invite them into fellowship with God, right? Jesus set an example for this. I mean, the worldly people rant and scream and berate those people. We Christians do not. We are to be salt and light to the darkness of this world. We are to be slow to anger, loving deeply, especially those who are furthest from Christ. Man, this is what Jesus tried to model, right? He went and ate with sinners, with those deemed furthest from God. He invited them to hang out and to be a part of his inner group. And a lot of times people are like, well, didn't Jesus like flip tables and made a whip and drove people out? Yeah, actually Jesus got the most angry at who? The religious elite, the people who are supposed to be the salt and light of their generation, but were not. I mean, Jesus always met people with compassion for those who are furthest from God. And he's like, remember, as we read up there, continue in the work that he did. And so that was kind of the worldly person and the worldly Christian, right? Their life looks the same. And so what do we do now? We stir up the spirit in our life. And so as we stir up this milk, hopefully put enough chocolate syrup, it starts to turn to a different color. And so now it is chocolate milk. It looks differently than it did before. There's actually not a part of here that is still regular milk, right? You can't just like take out mm, this section. Okay, that's normal milk still. Man, the Holy Spirit is permeated throughout the whole of this person's life. And this is where we, this is where we see the change. I mean, a spirit-filled person lives a different life. 
Their work life looks different. Their relationships at work, at church, at home, with their kids, with their marriage, whatever it is, they look different. They're having fellowship with the Spirit, experiencing the sustaining life found only in the Spirit, which leads to peace. Right? This person is governed by the Spirit. It's no longer them who reigns in their life. They look completely different. It's like a dead person coming back to life. How crazy is that? And so in order to kind of build this out, we need to kind of figure out how do we stir of the Spirit in our life? Man, how do we do this practically? So I have kind of three points here um, of how we do this in our life. And so the first one here um, is, man, when the Spirit enters our life, He's going to convict us of things in our life, right? Because before Christ, we were all worldly. So as we become believers and as we walk with Christ for a lifetime, there's things in our life that are still worldly. And so what does He do? He's like, "Mm, hey, man, that's got to go, or that's got to change. And so we're kind of met with a decision here. We can either, A, rule and reign over our own lives and continue on um, in the direction we were going, like, no, 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 no thanks. Kind of like I did with that guy, right? Or we could say, okay, you're right. Man, you are God. I am not. So therefore, I'm going to submit my life to you, and you rule and reign in my life, and we start walking the power of the Spirit. This is what repentance is, is when we're confronted with something in our life that is sinful, that is wrong, or that is different from God, we stop, we turn around, and we walk the other way. And this is hard. We acknowledge and we repent. But the Spirit never meets us with guilt and shame. That's what Satan does. Conviction is different than guilt. Conviction always has with it an air of grace and love. I mean, the Spirit always leads us to life, to more life. And in that direction, he never is leading us away from life. So we can be confident that as he meets us and he confronts us with something in our life, he has more planned for us, right? We walk in his life. My brother kind of had the first grandkids of the family. Um, and so as they're learning to walk, man, they fall a lot and they fall hard. One of them just kind of bounces, loves it. Um, but what does my brother do? He's not like, oh my gosh, you're a failure. You can't even walk yet? Most people can walk. Like, get it through your head, kid. You can walk. He doesn't do that. He's a kid. Right? So he comforts him, picks him back up, and he lets him try again. And this is what God does with us. Right? He loves us. He picks us back up. And he points us to a life dwelt with his spirit. Because we know that Christ has died for all of, all of our failures, our past, our present, and our future. And so we can be confident as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit that he will convict us of worldly things and we can continue to join more and more in life with him. Point two. Um, We do this in a community of believers. So Hebrews 10 um, up here. Because it is so important to have a community of believers around us who stir up the Spirit in our lives and we stir up the Spirit in their lives. So Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 up here says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So remember as we talked about meals and fellowship, we're supposed to have meals and fellowship with each other also. And so in our small groups, in these fellowship times, men, as we get around other believers, we're to encourage one another, we celebrate with one another, and we lament together with one another. And in all aspects of our life, we have the body of Christ with us. And so who knows your walk? Does anyone know your walk with God? And not like, oh, yeah, I talked to a person like two months ago. No, 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 like, man, this week. Does someone know what you're going through this week of what you need to be prayed over for? of what some of the stresses are at your work and your family. Man, be around a body of believers. And I can't tell you how invaluable these like, good friends have been in my life. Man, they've been priceless. They've stirred up the spirit in my life, convicted me of sin, actually pointed me in the right direction, man, and I've loved it. And some of my closest friends know my deepest walk with Christ. So it's crucial that we do not do our faith alone. Last point here. In order to stir up the spirit in our life, man, we actively read the scripture, right? And I have put that there on purpose, right? We actively read the scripture. Back in the 12th century, there's this guy named Bernard of Clairvaux. What a name, right? But he had an even weirder nickname. It's called the Honey Tongue. I do not want that nickname, right? But he was called the Honey Tongue of how he talked about who God was, um, and he would talk about, man, he chews and digests the scripture. Again, kind of weird. 
And so what does this really mean? How, does we, how do we chew and digest the Scripture? What does this mean? And so when we actively read the Bible, we observe what is being said. I mean, we read it slowly. We think. We pray through it. And then we obey it. We count it to our lives as truth. I mean, and if you're confused, and let's be honest, there are so many things that are super confusing in the Bible. I'm not going to shy away from that. But we seek answers. We don't just kind of ignore it and be like, eh, whatever. Man, we see it, we acknowledge it, and I'm going to go seek answers. This is also part of the role of a small group, right? Bring questions to your small group. I love when people bring questions. As a Christian, don't be afraid of questions. Have questions, bring them to the body of Christ, and let's work on them together. This is what um, Weird Bernard says when he's like, man, chew and digest the Scripture. Sometimes we have to sit with it for a while to really understand, to really let it sink in. And he's like, man, it's going to be as sweet as honey in our lives. And something, sometimes when we read the Bible, we're going to get confronted with things in our life, and we're like, mm, I don't know, that's kind of awkward. I don't know if I really want to do that. Right? It is imperative that we talk to others about Jesus all the time. It is throughout the whole Bible. Right? Or we're supposed to count others as more important than ourselves. Or more, uh, we're supposed to live our life as a living sacrifice for Christ. Man, that's confusing and awkward sometimes. And so how do we do that? How do we walk in the power of the Spirit? That is what this is about. Man, or maybe it's like, man, don't conform to the image of this world. And some of these things are hard, and it takes time to learn, and it takes time to chew and digest these scripture. But all of this leads to a sustaining life in Christ. So we submit our life to the work of the Holy Spirit, and we see what he does, see who he's going to introduce us to, see how he's going to move in and through us. Right? So I've loved living abroad. I've loved getting to be able to see people's lives changed from going from death to life and the craziness that is the Holy Spirit. I mean, as we lived in Eastern Asia, uh, we got to see eight students come to know Christ. And we left, went to Thailand, we were, uh, had a little bit of a break, uh, didn't know that we were actually going to have to be recalled because of COVID. And so the eight people that we actually uh, got to see trust Christ, we got to connect to my friend at the beginning. I didn't know that I needed him so much, but God knew. COVID didn't surprise God. All right, so we got to connect those people to him in his church. Um, and now they're walking uh, with local believers there. That's amazing. And lives radically changed. Well, we got recalled back to the U.S., um, but we're headed back out here in about a month and a half at the end of August. Um, East Asia is still closed due to COVID, and so we're like, man, where is the door open? And so we're actually headed to the Middle East in about a month and a half. I don't know the language. I barely know. I don't know any of the culture, but we are so excited to see what God does. I mean, there's crazy stories coming out of the Middle East right now. I'm like, man, I want to go be a part of that. I want God to use me like that, and let's go. One of my friends actually got to go over um, a little bit ago, and they put on this American football camp in the Middle East. Um, and they're like, all right, yeah, yeah, let's come. Let's teach American football. And so he's over there, um, and this guy walks up to him, not a part of the camp. And the guy walks up to him and goes, hey, man, I know you. And he goes, mm, I don't think so. I'm from Texas. You definitely do not know me, not from here. And he's like, no, 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 I do. You were in my dream last night. And he's like, you and Jesus were in my dream, and Jesus told me you have something to tell me. And so uh, my friend laid out the gospel, laid out who Jesus is, and, he's, and now that guy is a believer, traveling around the Middle East, telling other people about who Jesus is. And I'm like, man, that's crazy, right? Dead people coming back to life. That same spirit of God who caused dead people to come back to life in Ezekiel is the same spirit of God who's with us today. And some, some people are like, I don't know, like those stories are kind of like just for over there. I don't know. He does crazy things here too. I had a guy who I discipled here uh, in the States, and he's been kind of like resistant. He's like, I don't really know if I really want to talk to people at my workplace about Jesus. I don't know, it could get weird. I'm like, yeah, probably could. And so he's like, fine, I'm just going to give in. So he wrote five guys' names down. He handed it to a small group so they could pray over these five names. He's like, all right, these are five guys that I'm actually going to go talk to and uh, talk about Jesus with. So they prayed through these five names, and then that week, my friend goes out uh, back to work, as he does every week, and one of those guys on the list comes up to him. He goes, hey, man, I know you're a Christian, and i got some questions, man. I'd love to kind of sit down with you. So they go back over to my friend's house, and at the dinner table, my friend shares the gospel, and this guy comes to know Christ. And he's now having conversations with three of those five guys that he's been paying, uh, praying for. And I've loved it. Man, the same Holy Spirit is doing some crazy things here. And I've loved 
getting to hear stories about how God is moving. But a lot of my stories actually don't end with someone coming to know Christ or, you know, don't have a happy ending on them, and a lot of them don't. But what they do all have in common is someone who's stepping out in the power of the Holy Spirit, submitting their life to God, and just see what happens. Man, they're living an empowered life by the Spirit, experiencing the fullness of life in Christ. And so my wife and I, man, we would love to grab coffee with anyone here. Man, have fellowship. Hear your story. Remember, I'm a story person. I want to hear your story. Man, how is God working in your life? So let's pray, um, and we can go. Father, a woman, we a woman, I need a woman, I need a sheen, I need a shoe. A woman, bangju, bangju woman. A gay woman, need a art, I need a sheen. Woman, shuyao ni. Woman, I ni ni I woman. She she ni feng yesu de mingzi. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's continue to worship, and we're gonna take up the offering during this time as well.